as the next speaker. So you can start, John. Yeah, fine. I need to swap my uh, things. I've done the same as uh, Simon Connell. Um, um, you, you've so got my, uh, we see the full screen. We see the full screen. Yes, I. You you see the full screen. Yes, I know. But you've only got this other bit as well, haven't you? So, okay. Uh, that's not much use. So um, what happens if I do that? Okay, I find out how that works. There we go. Okay, I'm going to talk yeah. about nuclear shapes and collective structures, and uh, um, some of this repeats uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, are you seeing this next slide and so on as well? Because I think that's not right. Um, I have to stop share. What does that do? Now I have to share it again. Uh, Barra. Perfect. Okay, right. So, um, uh, yeah, we a lot of this is in the review article we wrote for EPJA um, uh, um, on stiff deformed nuclei and uh, the beta and gamma degrees of freedom. So I'm somewhat going to repeat some of the things that uh, I did before. Uh, here's the co-authors: Rob Bark, Susan Bumby, Chepo Dinoco and some of the MSc and now doing PhD uh, students that um, contributed uh, in a large manner to this. So um, hopefully, next slide. Um, I want to warn you that simple pictures can be misleading and you've seen a lot of these with red and blue balls um, uh, tightly packed like as though they're on a uh, three-dimensional billiard table and then some uh, words underneath but uh, those of us who know anything about if you uh, about quantum mechanics know that uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells you that the nucleon nucleon interaction is not strong enough to localize the neutron so it's actually a purple soup and uh, and the uh, wave functions are spread throughout the nucleus and this is known from knockout from uh, uh, colleagues at Liverpool who did this in uh, published in 1969 and for instance uh, if you want to measure a property of a nucleus uh, the radius you could only measure the mean square radius uh, by electron scattering or proton scattering or whatever you can't actually measure the radius because there's always a, a quantum uncertainty or a fuzziness of the nucleus now if you look at this uh, these words underneath you see, it says an atomic nucleus is a compact bunch. It isn't a bunch. That's a bunch of bananas or a bunch of apples. It's a quantum liquid of positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons. The neutrons and protons are the glue that hold the nucleus together. There's an excess of neutrons or protons. The nucleus is unstable, etc. So there's a lot of misleading stuff going on and has done in the past. And I want to deal with that. Now, if you want to look at vibrations of a liquid drop, you can uh, do this with uh, looking at a superfluid incompressible liquid spit, uh, uh, sphere, which uh, John William Strutt did uh, a long time ago, and 150 years ago. And of course, you get the frequency of the oscillation, which is squared here for simplicity, um, is proportional to the gamma, uh, which is the surface tension divided by the uh, density and the radius cubed, or the volume. And uh, so uh, you can prove this with uh, dimensional analysis, which I did last time. And you get a formula like this so if you want to include the uh, Coulomb term, but this is pretty small. And you can get the surface tension uh, from the surface term in the Weissacker um, by, uh, binding energy formula that you'll start nuclear physics with. Uh, this uh, is also derived because you have to get the multipolarity of the oscillation. So lambda is that, so for quadrupole oscillations, it will be two. And uh, he works it out for, for both, uh, uh, both types of uh, quadrupole op oscillations. It's quite funny, this, um, this article. It's in German, so you have to know German. Right, so if you work this out and quantizing this by putting the energy of any excitation of an oscillation, equal to h bar omega and using this where you put it in more convenient units. CS is about 18 MeV 
uh, the radius uh, parameter is 1.3 fermis, and you get uh, for quadrupole vibrations, you get an energy going like this with the mass number, and you get a and you get a and you get a, a, a much higher energy for octopole vibrations, lambda equals three. Here's the pairing gap. Can you see the pairing gap uh, if you calculate it using the energy from Bohr and Molson? So the classical result says that vibrations are well above the pairing gap, and it's always mildly amazing that the low um, collective structures in the pairing gap have been identified with this type of uh, semi-classical vibration. Now, how do you measure the pairing? One way of doing it is in a deformed nucleus is by uh, looking at the famous backbend. So if you have an alignment, you have to have the uh, Coriolis term in the Hamiltonian has to overcome the uh, uh, the binding, the pairing energy. So you have to have enough pairing energy in order to um, uh, to align these uh, high chain orbitals. And so it's proportional to Jx, so it's uh, going to happen for high spin orbitals in the first place. So uh, that's how you me can measure the pairing. And um, if you look at uh, um, the pairing approximation, which is a very crude approximation, you you lower the um, you lower the spin zero, uh, and then you keep all the other states where the two particles J M and J M prime are not uh, uh, are not coupled to zero, and you say they are not going to move. Uh, well, this clearly isn't true, and um, uh, it um, just shows you just about the difficulty of making pairing. And then, of course, if you want to split the pairing, which I talked about last year. Uh, and you have split them into prolate orbitals and oblate orbitals, uh, then of course there's uh, two uh, states that are lowered and uh, with a smaller pairing gap in the case of the nuclei that we looked at. So um, uh, if you look at um, two nucleons outside closed shells, so there's lead 210, that's two neutrons outside, uh, uh, two G9 Hase neutrons outside uh, lead 208, then you can recouple these to spins, only uh, even spins, two, four, six, eight. And if you look in uh, P134, uh, these are G7 halves protons, and they are um, um, can only couple up to six, spin six. G9 halves, for instance, molybdenum 92, two protons couldn't be coupled to eight, eight plus. Now you'd think that. Uh, if you, these are just recoupling the same, uh, same orbital, uh, two particles in the same orbital. So you'd think that uh, if you wanted to break them and get a different spin, that would be the next excited state. Well, the, here's the pairing gaps according to Bohr and Mottelson's book. And uh, the uh, next excited state uh, in each nucleus is uh, 10 plus here, six plus there, and a zero plus here. So you can see these are right above and there, um, there are no, um, there are no uh, uh, vibrations in the pairing gap. If they, these were, were just vibrations of any type, semi-spherical nuclei, uh, they surely should be coming here, but this isn't. This is just the realignment of these. Now, what I've done is um, uh, calculated uh, the experimental pairing gap in that way for semi-magic nuclei. So you either hold either Z or N constant, and if you go all the way from the calcium 40, well, 42, uh, up to the actinides, uh, you really get a much flatter um, uh, behavior of the, of the pairing energy than you do otherwise. These two points for, for tin, uh, well, there's not much data on them, so I don't really believe them. So, but when you cut those out, it looks even more impressive. Right, and we all know the moments of inertia are not superfluid. So here's a, a sort of reasonably recent current data on um, uh, the uh, moments of inertia. And the uh, uh, um, uh, irritational will be right down the bottom here, uh, superfluid. Uh, the rigid rotation, which means you get no, the nucleus would be totally rigid, so you get no, uh, um, no, uh, no vibrations at all. And of course, it's in between. Uh, uh, so uh, that's going to actually put the vibrational energy up. Now, uh, 
let's start looking at the convention. We want to look at the quadrupole degrees of freedom, and we're going to use the Lynn convention and the beta and gamma. And you all know about this mainly. Here's, the, here's a prolate shape at gamma equals naught, and here's uh, the oblate shape at uh, gamma equals 60. And both of these two shapes are, of course, actually symmetric. And if we just turn the uh, thing around a bit and so make this axis horizontal here, we get uh, uh, the gamma here is, uh, is all this region, all this region here between the two axes is going to be, uh, is going to be triaxial. Right, so we know that we can't measure, for instance, we had an axially symmetric prolate nucleus. Uh, if you want to disturb it away from that particular deformation, uh, you're going to have to give it energy, and that will, means you could uh, have the equivalent of a potential. And if you have a potential, you're going to have excited states in it. And the Bohr and Mottelson idea was, well, let's make this simple, and we'll just uh, um, we'll just keep it with uh, um, we'll just keep it with uh, a simple harmonic oscillator, and then you get states that are separated uh, by uh, or exactly h bar omega the same energy. Now, uh, you can also make it a square well, which here Kello did, not for any good reason that I could make out. And uh, that uh, has the cunning effort of putting the first excited state up uh, much higher, and therefore you lose it and you're not embarrassed by its non-existence. Uh, so that was one idea. And of course, you can do the same for the gamma degree of freedom. You'd have an equivalent potential. So that, and Bohr and Mottelson assumed that the, uh, any gamma vi uh, beta vibration, so-called, and gamma vibration were, um, were not coupled. So uh, these are uh, quantum uncertainties. They're not actual vibrations as such. They're just the un quantum uncertainties or fluctuations uh, that you get normally. Now, what about the data? And I'm going to concentrate uh, in this talk on the, uh, on the gamma deformation. Now, here's this uh, beautiful um, piece of work by Sir Bonga Majola for his uh, PhD thesis, where he looked at the, we're using gamma sphere, he looked at the uh, gamma band and fought it all the way up to about uh, spin uh, 43 or something. And he sees both the odd and the even members of the gamma band. Here's the uh, so-called beta band, and uh, here's the uh, ground state band. And here's the normal alignment that you get of two I13 halves particles. And then we have these other three bands here. Uh, uh, this one in green looks like it's a, just an alignment built on the configuration here of whatever the naught plus state, uh, first excited naught plus state is. And these two look like a gamma band built on top of the aligned band. And there was um, uh, even more um, fascinating data come out previously uh, using gamma sphere again uh, with Ollier and, um, and John Simpson and uh, all the usual gang. Uh, and here he's got a gamma band, but this is only the odd members. They don't see the even members. And that, this tracks the, uh, uh, um, the uh, gamma band right through the, uh, the first, uh, first alignment and then second proton alignment. And if you just look at the alignments themselves, you see how beautifully it all tracks. There's a perfectly good reason why this is a bit, uh, a bit split here. And that's uh, the reference is down here at the bottom. Right, well, the need for the gamma band is always nicely illustrated, in my opinion, by this uh, calculations by Nisik, Peter, Ring, and N people in a FizRev letter. And uh, here they calculated using very sophisticated relativistic energy density functionals, whatever that means. I have read papers on it, I'm still baffled. Um, and uh, their point was they got two minima. They got one in oblate here and one on prolate. And they said that this was rather flat, like uh, Iacello, and was this uh, an example of X5. But then when they uh, hired a, a clever Zipan Lee, uh, from, um, from Chongqing in, uh, in China. Uh, he uh, calculated with uh, the energy surfaces with the uh, gamma, and uh, you see these two are connected in the gamma plane. So they're only one minimum, really. Uh, the, the message is you cannot ignore the gamma degree of freedom. There's no way you can do sensible calculations without. 
Now let's go back to the Bohr Hamiltonian and it uses a five dimensional state with the three Euler angles and then beta and gamma. And um, uh, what he does, he uses the usual parity prescription. So he's got uh, some variable like beta for instance. And so he's got a, a potential here, simple harmonic oscillator. And then he's got the momentum here. And you get the momentum by differentiating it with respect to the, the to alpha dot. And that gives you a d alpha dot and you get the frequency equals to c over d and you quantize it by putting the uh, uh, the um, the alpha, the degree of freedom and its momentum and you say these don't commute and you put it equal to minus i h bar. So uh, you this was the original uh, Bohr Hamiltonian which is not exactly elegant and um, so Zipan Lee and other people have been using five dimensional collective tensions where they not only have the usual problem of the mass parameter, but they have the uh, a variable mass parameter as well. And uh, the rotational energy is just the usual, uh, involves the usual moment of inertia. So um, uh, this is a so-called covariant density functional model to calculate the potential with which to solve their Bohr Hamiltonian. So here's an example of uh, Iterbium 160 and 162. And you see the surface is energies here. I've chosen it to be especially complicated. So you can see that the minima in here and any vibrational, so-called vibrational excitations built on that potential will be pretty complicated. And uh, this is all discussed in uh, another paper led by uh, Sirbonga Majola. Right, so um, this is, uh, to my amazement, this is, uh, has been a rather enormous success. Um, so uh, we calculated, they calculated, we measured and uh, the, uh, the Chinese calculated lots of things around the Z equals 90 nuclei. Here we have disposed in 156 up to the Terbium 160. And you see, let's take uh, Erbium, disposed in 156 and Erbium 158. Here's the ground state band, here's the align band, here's the so-called beta band, and here's the um, um, two plus, three plus, four plus, et cetera, of the, um, uh, of the, of the gamma band. And uh, you'll notice that these are split in the terbiums, so you get a crossing here. Uh, here's the guys who are doing it, Rob Bach and Sia Bonga and myself. And what it does extremely well is get the signature splitting right. That is the splitting of the of the um, of the gamma band between the odd and even uh, members. And so you can see this this changes quite a lot. And the calculations, which are in red, do extremely well. So uh, and uh, this is very odd. They mix, but with the it's due to mixing with the uh, with the uh, so-called beta band. And that's you. Here's this uh, um, potential surface. And Linda McCleskey had a nice example in YB162, where he's got these two crossing. But on the other hand, it turns out just to be this looks like a, a Landau Zener crossing. But if you just continue them, you see the the separation, the signature splitting uh, goes down. So uh, there you go. Well, where's the hope for calculating all this stuff? Because it's not so easy. Well, there's hope in shell models. And um, this is uh, using the data that we had. Um, there's a triaxial projected shell model, which is um, uh, been, being run by Javid Sheik. And a paper by, with the student uh, Jangia et al uh, on it. Uh, it uh, does very well because you get the ground state, fine. Everybody gets that. And then you get a gamma band built on it because you have the gamma degree of freedom. And then you have a K equals four band uh, also predicted. And you have a splitting here, which is a bit too big. You get the uh, aligned band here so they can do the alignments. So, uh, and then you get another alignment here on top of that, the protons, uh, which is somewhere this one, red coming down. And this is just a blow up of this bit here. And so you do that, that and you also predict these uh, gamma bands that we thought we observed on top of the um, uh, on top of the um, 
um, intrinsic, uh, 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 intrinsic states, the beta and the gamma, so and the aligned states. So um, what you need, we don't get, uh, they don't get the uh, beta bands right, the right energy because they have, um, uh, they just, you have a, the standard uh, sort of Hamiltonian pairing and the quadrupole pairing and so on, but that's not much use. What you really need is split monopole pairing. So you lower the, um, the zero plus due to two, um, two neutrons. Uh, and so you need, uh, so you get the right pairing um, isomer. Okay, so they successfully predict gamma and gamma gamma bands and the alignment uh, of the, uh, the S band and of the protons. Uh, and you get the observed gamma band built on the S band and so on and so forth. What well, the failures are is the pairing's too crude and the signature splitting is not spot on. Well, what about the crank Nielsen Stratinsky without, with and without pairing? Uh, there's an experiment, uh, for example, on lutetium 167. Uh, how did I manage to get back to that? Um, 167 lutetium, which is again experiments done with uh, gamma sphere, and you can see how complicated it is because these are the positive parity bands, and these down here are the negative parity bands. Uh, so that's just the experiment. And uh, the theory uh, been uh, Azam Kadan and uh, I think Jules Carlson uh, uh, put in a lot of work to use the old um, ultimate crank up. Uh, um, calculations of Bohr of um, uh, yeah um, and uh, which had pairing in the add pairing into this thing but they were very complicated and you could really need the new modern computers parallel computing in order to do it uh, to do this and um, so uh, one of the interesting things of this that people might uh, have a look at is that there are polarization effects. So they'd always produce for high spin states with which uh, these calculations were so uh, so good, for instance, Erbium 158, and also in, um, in super, defamation, def, uh, super defamation, like uh, uh, we had in um, gadolinium 147, uh, he could predict the various orbits and, and band crossings that we saw in super defamation. Now, uh, the amusing thing here is for those of you who've been talking about uh, per, um, the polarizing effect, the, what actually happens is that the, as you spin them more, the, um, uh, the, the beta, the average deformation goes down. So they're not stretching, they're doing this anti-stretching, if you like. Well, um, there's also the advance Monte Carlo shell model that Takaharu Atsaka has been working on with uh, postdoc uh, UC Sunanada, Sudona. Um, and he had a FISREV letter out recently, uh, which uh, uh, just a year ago, uh, and he claims that what uh, nuclei actually do is uh, they're a fine example of quantum self organization. Uh, so they can organize their single particle energies by taking up different uh, configurations of proton and neutrons, depending on the eigenstate, uh, the level. And, um, and then he discusses in considerable detail the effects of the monopole and, uh, and uh, tensor forces and so on. So uh, uh, what they do is they have a horrendous core. So they have a core which is actually uh, zinc, uh, zirconium 110, and then they have all these uh, orbitals here that are drawn in and, and are enumerated uh, as part of their shell model, which give them a huge space, but then they have cunning techniques to reduce all that. And uh, this is just an example, this slide of what happens as you go from the ground state here. So here's the single particle energies of the ground state. So, uh, and here are the single particle energies when you go up to the first excited state. Uh, so this is the prolate triaxial um, configurations. And again, you get this uh, for the neutron. This is the protons. This is the neutrons. And these are triax triaxial state, state, states, shapes. 
Right, so he's calculated the example he shows he, uh, is Sumerian 154. So you've got the ground state here, and the ground state, uh, this is the minimum with many samples, and he gets, uh, and he gets that almost actually symmetric. If you look at the first excited naught plus state, that's the pairing isomer in my view, uh, then you find that's very triaxial, right? And also the two plus state above it of the, in the beta band, this is also has the same shape. And then when you go to the K, K equals two band, the gamma band, then uh, that has a triaxial shape as well. So you can start with, a, with an actually um, symmetric ground state and end up with the um, with a, a two glazer part of Gand head uh, will be here. Okay. So um, recently uh, on Monday, uh, when the, um, the conference uh, began, um, I got an email with him with uh, uh, some new calculations which he's done for Erbium 166, which he claims are rather different. So he, here's the experiments that uh, that he's comparing with, and he's just fixing beta, so he's only looking at uh, really looking at the gamma bands. So here's the ground state band, 0, 2, 4. Then there's the usual gamma band, K, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and all the rest of it. And then he gets another K equals 4 band up here. So here's his calculations. And here's uh, what are they called? They're called uh, uh, the constrained Hartree Fock. Uh, uh, and uh, here's a Bohr Hamiltonian with a square well potential and uh, a rigid triaxial model here. So you see, he does really, very well. And so he says, thus, the two lowest bands in Erbium 166 can be considered to be a consequences of the common triaxiality with rigidity. And the K equals four state does not correspondence to a, a double photon excitation. So here's his summary. He says there, this is a fine example, nuclei, a fine example of quantum self-organization. Two quantum fluids, two major forces, the quadrupole interaction, monopole interaction. And he says the two the zero first excited uh, zero plus of the beta, uh, so-called beta state, beta band head, and the gamma band head may not be members of beta or gamma vibration, but are tracks lead to form states with stronger fluctuations. So um, what, uh, there are no vibrations? Uh, well, not down here at low energies. And, uh, and uh, really it means that the phonons or boson models are uh, not really relevant either. Okay, that's my lot. Okay. okay, John, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, so are there any questions? Or comments? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment actually. Quite an yes. impressive list of students that John showed, whom he has supervised. Yes. But also at this stage, we should also acknowledge John's contribution because he established the yes, Matsuki and the Manas programs, mm -hmm. and particularly in the case of the University of Zululand. This made a major contribution to the changing of, uh, uh, to the training of MSc and PhD students. I think before the program started, since inception in physics, UZ had trained one, maybe two MSc students. But after that, the numbers increased exponentially. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the staff at the present MRT have come through the Manas Matsuki program. So John, thank you very much for that. Very kind of you to say so. <laughs> yes, I also got to learn that uh, our supervisor, Rob Bach, Simon Mylins, Elena Lurie, they all came through John. So thank you very much. So there hey, is John. a question. Yeah, yes, I can. have a comment. Uh, yes. John, how are you? Hey, Stefan. Stefan, nice to see you. Uh, you don't see me, but you hear me. <laughs> Uh, there's one comment, and that concerns uh, the gamma phonons and uh, rigid triaxiality. 
in fact, it's the same thing. If you think of a gamma vibration, uh, it carries two units of angular momentum. And that is nothing but a wave, a surface wave, that runs with the angular momentum over the surface. When you go to a frame that is fixed with a wave, it's a, it's a rigid deformation. It's a fixed. If you know, like a two-dimensional pendulum and you swing it on a rope, and then uh, this can be understood as two vibrations with a phase uh, difference of two. Uh, in, in the x and the y direction. And, and that is also the case for the gamma vibration because it carries angular momentum. And the, 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 the k equal four thing is then you have two of these and so you just extend the deformation somewhat. So this is a, not a contradiction, so they, they are there. And you can see them as a rotational picture or you can see them as harmonic vibrations. This is my tidal wave idea. Yeah, but uh, you've also uh, got a terrible complication, which I had never, I didn't have any time to try and even start on, uh, which is you also, if you think things um, mainly and best represented by putting in a more complicated shape, uh, or that the uh, quantum mechanics of the single particle movement in the, in the nucleus can change its shape from uh, state to state or configuration to configuration. Uh, it becomes more complicated. So the uh, models that uh, um, just have a, a vibration or wave or whatever, uh, and after that, when you want to pick anything up, you're really doing just um, Klebsch-Gordon coefficients of coupling one thing to another. But that's why you can't uh, uh, you can't use phonons or bosons, according to um, uh, Takaharu. He um, He's saying that uh, you, you've changed the situation. So it isn't a simple phonon or excitation or a boson excitation that you can add up in the old bohr molson way. You have to, it's more complicated because, and that depends on the particular shells that you've got and valence shells you've got. So um, yeah, uh, I'm always surprised that the Bohr model, uh, the, uh, the old Bohr model gets anywhere, the simple collective model. Uh, and amazed how he did so well with the um, five-dimensional calculations um, uh, of um, Zipan Lee and people. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, there's a lot to do still, which is fun. Keep us in business, and certainly until I finished. And probably you, you're probably as almost as old as me. <laughs> okay, but nice to see you and that you're doing well. <laughs> Well, yeah, I am, but I'm getting, uh, yeah, not as well as I used to. I've given up skiing for a start. <laughs> it's tragic. And my wife's pretty ill at, the moment, at this very moment, which is complicated. Yeah. So I should apologize for not coming to many more of the talks, which I would dearly have loved to do. My, my computer attended, but I didn't <laughs> always. Uh -huh. I had a priority interrupt. Family first, physics second. Thank you, John. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments to John? Uh, I have a, a, a kind of question. Yes, you Okay. Uh, the question is, how does one visualize this when you do this uh, shell model Monte Carlo? Can you sort of uh, visualize it by uh, seeing the time evolution and, you know, making density plots or something like that? Um, otherwise, it's just a mixture of, you know, maybe millions of states. And how does one... Uh, yeah, that's right. Interpret it? Yeah, tough luck. Okay. So it's not possible to project in time and uh, see the but density. But you can draw all these nice uh, diagrams of papers of, of, uh, of uh, nuclei as uh, little red balls. But, I mean, it misleads the sweet and innocent like myself. And uh, it takes a long time to get out of that sort of thing and remember your quantum mechanics and know that things aren't localized. But they're not localized, they're all spread all over the, the nucleus. That's the whole point of having a quantum liquid. And uh, quantum liquids are gonna do subtle things and uh, mm -hmm. uh, good on them, it'll keep us in business. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay.
Thank you. Thank it's Waldemar. Wald Waldemar. Okay, John. Valde Kurban. Oh, hi, uh, Kurban. Uh, it was nice to <clears throat> hear you again. Uh, I noticed that this, your famous flying fish orbital is never present in calculations of Tsunoda and Otsuka. How do you comment this? Uh, well, uh, it will be if you if you use an interaction uh, and don't have pairing in it, then it will be in there intrinsically because it's just due to the uh, the interaction of particles and the, um, the quantum mechanics. But um, uh, it's because people this was all solved in the very early 1970s, and then people forgot it again. I think it was too intellectual, and uh, they liked their their, uh, all their balls and their s simple, simple view of uh, protons and neutrons in nuclei, and uh, and I think that's been it. It's certainly taken a long time to for me to try and get my rather slow mind around everything. I must say. So uh, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, the uh, the pairing approximation is only just another approximation because you see the the pairing approximation is pretty rough anyway, and it, you can split it and then you get a, a pairing isomer. And that's a that's a nice. Uh, uh, a nice picture for uh, Vivek data, but in the end, it's it's uh, you can see these calculations that he's got with a multi uh, Monte Carlo sh shell model program that they're more complicated. They're more uh, they're more complicated in the in the five dimensional calculations of um, Zifan Li and so on, and they're certainly complicated in the triaxial projected shell model because that's just another shell model. But it shows you what the wave functions are doing, and it's showing you that they get much more mixed as you go up past the first backbend and so on. That's uh, it's it's fascinating. Yeah, I a uh, lot to be done. Lots of nice experiments to do. <laughs> okay, John, I think we need to move on, no? Yeah, yeah, yes, sure. thank you, thank you. you are, 